The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, we're in the doctrine of the Antichrist, and we're on page two of your notes, Roman numeral four. God has established three adjustments to God. The first adjustment, obviously, is paramount. Without it, it's eternal condemnation for the individual. The first adjustment is the salvation adjustment. It's one step. It only requires one thing on the part of the individual, and that is a positive response to the gospel. Fulfilling the command to believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life and deliverance from eternal condemnation. You only have to do that once. It is permanent, and there isn't anything you or anyone else can do to separate you from your salvation. It is illustrated here by the circle. When a person believes they are entered into union with Christ, that is a permanent and spiritual union that has incredible repercussions for time and for eternity. It guarantees eternal life in a resurrection body ultimately and everything that goes with that. The second adjustment is also illustrated on this little diagram. In time as a believer, you're going to sin. While that isn't God's will for your life, we, you and I are going to get out of fellowship. What knocks us out of fellowship is personal sin. There's a whole list of items that constitute sin nature behavior. There's mental attitude sins like fear. I'll just pick one. There's t sins of the tongue, a lot lying, telling a lie would be an example. And then there are overt sins, like murder, I'll pick a big one. All these sins Jesus Christ died for, for every member of the human race for all time, during the three hours of darkness, when he was on the cross. Unbelievable. Think of the number of sins that are committed in just one minute on our earth at any given time. Add that all up to the entire human race, past, present, and future. Your sins were judged in Jesus Christ so that as a believer, all you have to do before God is confess your sins and you're forgiven. I don't care how many times. I don't care what the sin is. How about that? Otherwise, you remain ruled by your sin nature. We all start off in life locked into our sin nature. Little ones manifest sin nature activity and on up the ladder. You won't get through this day without sinning. So what are you gonna do? You're going to confess your sin if you do that and you will be restored to fellowship. Do it as many times as you need to. Here in Bible class, you need to be in fellowship. If you're out, I can't help you. You're not gonna learn what we're studying here. It ain't gonna make sense to you. You can't be ruled. So when you do rebound, you are under the control ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, that indwells each of us. We don't have the third adjustment illustrated here. Uh, by the way, this one needs to be repeated, unlike the first. Just, just data you need to know. The third adjustment is as a new believer or as a believer, God's plan for your life is to grow up spiritually. And how do you do that? You must be taught the truth 
you must have, we'll use the analogy, inhale, that's intake of Bible doctrine, understanding it, exhale is appropriate applications. They may be mental, they will all be mental, or some overt activity. You came here today, you got to do two items of application. Sing a couple hymns in fellowship and make a contribution to Maranatha Church. Now, because you didn't do the latter doesn't mean you're out of fellowship. There's other factors involved there. I'm not doing the doctrine of giving right now. So let's take the usual time to uh, make a, a decision that we're gonna sit here and pay attention and not let our minds run off and think about this and think about that. Your problems will take care of themselves and God will work them together for good, even your divine discipline. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, once again, this, this side of phase three, we assemble ourselves together to grow in grace and knowledge. We ask that you bless our time together, the communication of the information, and the understanding of it on the part of those who have an ear to hear. In Christ's name, amen. Probably everybody has heard that in some way or another, that an antichrist is coming. Now there are many, as in antichrist, you could take it one of two ways, substitute Christ, of which there isn't, and against Christ. The ultimate antichrist will appear on the world stage. The very minute you and I are resurrected out of here, commonly known as the rapture of the church. This dispensation will end, and the human race will, those left behind, the human race will move into the day of God's wrath. Now, when we're out of here, four individuals from the past are gonna appear on this earth. Four individuals who literally are from the past. They will be resurrected to a body of mortality, not a, you know, the other one. And these four individuals will appear on the earth and garner immediate, almost, world attention. They won't have to introduce themselves too much. The circumstances of their reappearing will be so dramatic that they cannot be ignored. Two of those individuals, and, there, and there's two on the bad side, Satan's side, and two on God's side. We'll have a, perhaps occasion to make mention of them, maybe not today. <clears throat> Again, this is, this is, anybody has basic understanding of, of the Bible. Jesus, Jesus transfigured himself in the presence of three of his disciples, on the Mount of Transfiguration, known in Israel as Mount Tabor. He transfigured himself in their presence. And two individuals showed up to join the so-called party, the event. None other brought up out of the underworld of paradise, Moses and Elijah were there. And Jesus is transformed into this shining, and, and the three disciples are there. They went up there with him. He left the other ones at the base of the mountain, walked up there, and had this event occur, which you can read about in your gospel accounts. His whole transformation and all the light coming from him and everything, that lasted during that Brief time, and then everything went back to normal. It looked like a regular, normal human being. It was to illustrate his glory at his coming. And since Moses and Elijah were the two prophets from of old that were picked to be there, they're the two that are going to show up in the tribulation. 
they're going to make a sudden appearance in Israel, in that area where John the Baptist ministered, the Judean wilderness. And they're going to start calling Israel back to God. Things are popping. They're going to call, start calling people back to God. Two, thing, two things these two prophets have in common. They both worked miracles during their public ministry. Most prophets, if not all of them, they didn't work any miracles. They just prophesied, communicated. But we know Moses did, obviously. And we know Elijah did. They're going to work miracles in the tribulation. You're going to read about it in the book of Revelation. They're going to bring environmental judgments down around the world. They're going to be hated. But they're going to call Israel back to God. Their disciples, their first line disciples, are the 144,000, if you've ever heard of them. They're going to serve God in the second half of the trip. Now, this is basic information. I suggest you pay attention as if your life depended on it, because this is important. <clears throat> the tribulation, as it is called, the day of his wrath, day of the Lord, etc., is exactly seven years long, going by the Jewish calendar of 12 months of 30 days each. You can, you can evaluate into three and a half years, first half, three and a half years, the second half. You can even do it by months, 42 months and 42 months, or days, 1,260 days, first half, 1,260 days, the second half. That's the tribulation. It begins with the removal of church age believers from the apostolic era to the end from the earth in a rapture event. Those of us who are alive will be transformed into a resurrection body right where we are, whatever we're doing. Awake or asleep, this or that, positive or negative, we're going to be transformed. All those that are in the grave, their bodies, their souls are going to re-inhabit their resurrected bodies. And we're going to stand up on the earth in front of all these people who are unbelievers. They're going to see it. It's, not, it's going to be quick, but they're going to see it. The clothing that we are wearing will fall to the ground and we'll have a new suit of clothes, a new, a new attire instantly, mind-boggling. And we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He doesn't come to the earth he, we meet him in the air. Short distance, we travel up and we're with him. And then we will, after our works are judged and we get our rewards, we'll go on to the third heaven and uh, see the uh, activity uh, going on there for the seven years. And then we'll come back with Christ at the second advent and watch him defeat all the armies that are gathered against Israel in the Middle East. That's called Armageddon. And he'll set up his kingdom on earth and we'll rule and reign with Christ. That's my destiny. Based on I believed in Jesus Christ back in the day. And I'm adding to my glory by doing my job and living before God and teaching Bible doctrine and doing whatever else I need to do. Now, the two bad guys that show up, they come out of the past. The Antichrist. We have identified him as Alexander the Great. Perhaps you've heard of him. As I told you, when I was in high school, even a sophomore, back in Hot Springs, South Dakota, I was taught Western civilization, ancient Western civilization, one of my courses. I was taught Latin. What good's that going to do you? Well, it did me some good. And I learned about these kingdoms of antiquity. And then all the history leading on up. Yes, it wasn't in depth like in a, in a college class, but it was sufficient 
to introduce me to the ancient world. And then when I became a believer and started getting involved with the Bible, I realized these kingdoms are all mentioned in the Bible. All of them. But now it has an importance it never had before. It was just information that could be interesting. They had a series on TV about Rome. I found it fascinating. I really liked it. The quality, it wasn't dealing with anything spiritual other than just dealing with the history of Rome. The young people today are being robbed of these kind of things. They're busy playing games on a phone. It just makes you stupid. Oh, you may be good at the game, but it doesn't make you smart. It does not. So, anyway. Oh, I didn't, uh, and I will mention that uh, Alexander's coming back. I'll show you the documentation. Take it, leave it. And another individual, the false prophet. And uh, I've made an educated guess as to who he is. I had to pick a famous prophet, false prophet. I couldn't just pick any old clown out there. I had to pick one with a big name. And he, and he had to be a Jew. So we're, we're narrowing the field down. He had to be a Jew. You say, where'd you get that? But we just, hang on. And uh, he had to be very well known. And he had to be, it, as it turned out, he had to be hated by the Catholic Church. And guess who it is? Nostradamus. Nostradamus. That's the why I picked him, because I don't know of a Jewish prophet uh, that had that stature in time and is still followed today, and they repeat his prophecies till this day. They're followers of Nostradamus. They read his prophecies. They're intriguing. They're in detail. But they're false, ultimately. He's not a prophet of God. As we know, many false prophets and teachers have gone out into the world, jam-packed with them. If you're positive, you'll, God will get you to the truth. If you're not, then you could very easily be taken in by some of them. Because in the last days, they proliferate. They're coming out of the woodwork. Men, women, this, that, Jewish, non-Jewish, different religions, they're all over the place saying stuff. All right, the advantages of the Alexander selection for the Antichrist. As noted, the Antichrist is not a person who is contemporaneous with the times in which he functions. He will come back in such a dramatic fashion. Anyway, uh, the... Uh, uh, Documentation. See, this, this, is a, this is an investigation. And this investigation must be based on the Bible. Now, in the book of Revelation, we have two Babylons mentioned. Uh, the one in chapter 17 of your Bible and the one in chapter 18. The one in chapter 17 has ancient roots, real ancient roots. Its origins go back to the Tower of Babel. Now listen to me. If you think the Tower of Babel is just some story, why is it today that the spirit of the Tower of Babel, the unification of the human race under one umbrella, is ongoing? And those who know about this have even reflected their link to this in architecture. Go online. Look at the EU building in Strasbourg, France. It, is, it looks weird. It looks like they didn't finish it. It's on purpose. It's on purpose. God disrupted the first New World Order movement 
that this president and others have made mention of? We're building a new world order. George Bush, Republican, senior. We're building a new world order in a thousand points of light. And somebody's sitting there and listen, what's that mean? Did you explain what that means? The forces of darkness do not want nations, multipolar world. They want unipolar, everybody under one umbrella. Back at the Tower of Babel, everybody started off speaking the same language, regardless of their racial characteristics. And they were going to build a tower and assault heaven the dummies, but that's what they were doing. And God intervened. He broke up the party by a phenomenal miracle. All these people out there, he erased their language from their memory, ba memory bank and put a new one in and the ability to speak fluently, whatever that language was. So this broke the whole party up. Nobody could get anything done because nobody could understand other people. And they dispersed like God told them to do after the flood. They dispersed. And they went out and they built these nations. Some went to Egypt. Some wound up there. And God's orchestrating this whole thing behind the scenes. The Far East, the Near East, Europe, blah, blah, blah. Some came across because there was a bridge uh, across to Alaska. Got a bunch of American Indians over here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this took centuries. Now they're trying to reverse it and put us all under one deal. They will not succeed. Nationalism is here to say it's a divine institution for the human race, not just believers. There are four divine institutions. They don't like any of them. <laughs> the first one is free will called volition. They want to eradicate that and make us transhuman, robotic, control us out there by taking some chip or whatever it is. More on that. It's amazing how stupid people are today. For all the information they're exposed to, they don't know, they don't know anything. But they're trying to make us all robotic. Part human, part machine. It's called transhumanism. They gotta control us. And they don't like free will that you make your own choice and determine your own deal. You will use your free will. You use it all the time. And then the next one uh, is marriage. And the last time I checked, it was between someone who is biologically a male and biologically a woman. They're the only ones that can produce new humans. But they're against that too. They don't want more people. They don't want the mandate of God in scripture which says, multiply and fill the earth. They say there's too many of us and we're destroying the earth. And there's all kinds of people at different levels have bought into this lie. So they want to reduce the human race. They want to kill us off. They want to fix it so we don't reproduce one way or another. <clears throat> that's, the, that's the second divine institution, marriage. Any other relationship that involves sexual activity, et cetera, et cetera, is out of line with God's plan. The third one is kiddos children, extended family. We used to call it the nuclear family. And uh, later on down the road, I mean, Adam and Eve had their first child out of the garden, but 
down the road, after the flood, we develop divine institution number four. It's called nationalism. Big nations, little nations, blah, 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 blah. That's God's plan. In fact, nationalism will exist on the new earth. The kings of the earth, the nations, bring their glory to the new Jerusalem. There will be nationalism forever. Now, I haven't worked out all those details, but that's not my topic right here. My topic right here is that the uh, identity, and it, it, back to Revelation 17 and 18. In chapter 17, the Babylon of that chapter, it's mystery Babylon. A mystery is something that's a secret, that's hidden. It doesn't mean it can't be understood. It's just hidden from the, the masses or whatever you want to call it. At the time of the Tower of Babel, when this all broke up due to the confusion of languages and people started walking off, heading out, it was a nonviolent thing. They just, they just left. I, I understand you, let's go. When this was broken up, there were, there were two, prime, there were two uh, big name people involved in all this. You've heard, one of them's mentioned in the Bible, the other isn't. Nimrod. Nimrod. Well, God sent an assassin to take him down. And he was a, he was a powerful guy pull, trying to pull all this together. And his wife, which isn't mentioned, Samarimus. And she was an evil woman. They both died, and they deified him. They deified him. This, this pattern of gaining deity after you die craziness. Uh, and so they built a religion around it with a priesthood and all the elaborate stuff. And the part of our focus has been on the mother-son cult of antiquity. I was going to get the book out. I didn't do it. Uh, written in, you know, a long time ago, in the late, late 1800s, I think, by uh, uh, Hislop was the author, his last name, Hislop. He wrote a book called Two Babylons. And the first Babylon, or is what all of this, this mother-son cult spread to all the nations, basically. Certainly all the major ones. And the name of the mother and the name of the son. I don't have time to go into all this. But the mother goddess, supreme goddess of the Babylonian system, his name, her name is Ishtar. Someone joked with me today, happy Ishtar. Our English word Easter is an anglicized form of Ishtar. Only idiots can bring this in to the church. And it was a fertility cult, among other things. A fertility cult. We've got two fertility symbols. It was a big sex cult. Fertility symbols. Bunny rabbits and chicken eggs. These two... These two creatures proliferate rapidly. <laughs> They're not the only fertility symbols, but, the, but we brought them into the church and we, um, yeah, okay. And, then, and, and then so, we, so we're running around telling people happy Easter and it's happy Ishtar. We're the suckers, the Christians. Anyway, I could go to the other nations and name the, the mother and her child is always a picture of a mother with a baby. Even as far away as China. And you see, if you're looking at the Catholic system, the Madonna and the baby Jesus. The mother is seen with the baby. Yes, they had variations within the different religions, the things they believed in, everything, but they had this basic core idea. Nothing original. 
I'm not talking about all the sub-deities and all that other mess. People worship rocks, flowers, <laughs> all that kind of stuff on the, over the face of the earth. I'm not talking intelligent people, humanly. Worship these, worship these multi-deities and all this business. Well, when Christianity got cranked up, the church age, something had to be done to save it. And that's the Roman Catholic Church, and that's Revelation 17. The Roman Catholic Church. Mary, that becomes your female deity. They said she was, they said she's divine. I didn't say it. She, they say it. You pray to her, blah, 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 all the rest of the mess. Nothing in the New Testament is reflective of anything close to this. Doesn't matter. They still have a priesthood. They have a high priest called the Pope. And in each of these systems, they had the same structure, same format. So, to save the old thing and keep it going, we have Mystery Babylon. She is portrayed as a woman. And she is uh, portrayed here in the imagery of John, who was uh, uh, shown this, this imagery of a woman uh, who is portrayed as a prostitute riding on a scarlet colored beast. That's the political power. And these systems all wanted to control the political power. That was the whole thing about the Catholic Church. Control these Catholic nations and get more nations under you and we'll get our orders from Rome and etc. And the kings of Europe and other places that were Catholic, they believed that they were serving the church, serving God, and that they would go to heaven if they served Rome, the Vatican in particular, not the city in large. So this system has spread all over the earth uh, uh, not it's not universal like everybody, but it's but it's has a history. She's riding on this beast, and uh, then we have the indictments against her. She's murdered believers, Spanish Inquisition, anybody? And uh, of course, you got to realize John. When this was given to John, this history was all out in front of him. This system wasn't up and running when he was around in ninety in ninety six A D. This thing developed down the road and has become what it is today. Now, for the documentation of first off, how do you know this is a man from the past? Verse 8. Verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss. The abyss is a symbol for hell. It's another term for hell. And go to destruction. That's his final place that he will repose. Lake of fire. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast. They'll, they'll, they'll get it. They will get it. That he was, past tense, is not and will come. Future tense. <clears throat> so, back, more information. Verse 9, here is the mind which has divine viewpoint, wisdom. The seven heads. Now imagine John sees in his vision a red bull-like creature and a woman dressed in scarlet and jewels and everything riding on it. And then it has seven heads going off the top of it. You ever, you ever see any of the statues of antiquity where they like to combine the powers of two different things, man and beast? I saw one on a wine bottle the other day. It was a horse. And then from the neck up, it's a man's chest and head right into the system. You see them all over in the ancient world. They believe you combine these powers. Not that these kind of creatures exist in the real world. It's just their imaginations. So this is, this is brought into the Bible. Seven heads. 
The seven heads are seven mountains. You say, well, that doesn't help me. They're not physical mountains. They're kingdoms. Mountains are used in the Bible of literal mountains and also of kingdoms. I can show you that all here and there. On which the woman sits. Seven mountains on which the woman sits. So she has a history with head one, two, three, four, and so forth, and so forth. And they are what? The seven heads, seven kings. Now, we, we, get, we got to go back to 96 AD, right at the end of the first century. John's living in what? The Roman Empire. He's living in the Roman Empire. There were these empires that preceded the Roman Empire, and each one of them fell to what the, the, the next one on the list. And so we have, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. This will be the most, the seventh head will be the most short-lived of all of them by far. It's only seven years. These other kingdoms lasted, you know, the Babylonian kingdom lasted, it was the shortest of all the others. But some of them lasted for centuries. You can go study your history. Uh, what, what is the rise and fall of head number whatever? Well, you'd have to know the name. Now, <clears throat> five have fallen, John. One is. That's the Roman Empire. One is. John lived his life in the Roman Empire. All the New Testament was written in the Roman Empire. Jesus appeared on the scene in the Roman Empire. And the first and the first Caesar, the first Caesar of that empire, it was a republic before then. The first Caesar of that empire was Augustus. Caesar Augustus. And then you have all the Caesars out from him. There's books on each of the names of these Caesars. Maybe they've had movies about some of them and on and on. Now, one is, the other must continue a little while. I already told you, a little while. Seven years only. That's a short career, but it's monumental. Now, We'll get to the final kingdom, which is described here in these following verses. I'll just, if you, if you read ahead, you'll get the idea that this woman who rides the beast in her final incarnation, the Roman Catholic Church centered in Vatican City with cathedrals and institutions all over the place. The, the seventh head and the ruler of the seventh head is going to turn on her. He's going to do the unthinkable. Hitler didn't do that. Hitler didn't advocate wiping out the Catholic Church. He's been made a candidate in the past for the Antichrist, but he doesn't qualify. Anyway, all this guessing through the church age. He will wipe out the Catholic Church. I can't get across to you how politically incorrect this man's going to be. He's going to hit the world stage and do stuff you can't even imagine. And he's going to take down the Catholic Church. We already covered a verse that says he's intolerable of any other religion. Period. And he takes down the Catholic Church. He plunders the church. You can read about it. These will hate the harlot, verse 16. Will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. He's going to torch the great cathedrals. He's going to strip the gold and wealth out of them. 
just this rampage. It's hard to even imagine that somebody can get that, that job done, let alone all the other stuff he's going to be doing. It's, it's hard to comprehend. For God has put it in their hearts. That's, he has uh, the ten horns. The ten horns are ten nations of, it's got to be Western Europe. These will hate the, the harlot and make her desolate. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose. God's going to have a common purpose with the Antichrist. On this point, on this point, we both want this done for different reasons. But we both want this done. Her day of judgment has come. God wants it done. He puts it in their heart to do it, and they do it. Until the words of God will be filled. The woman you saw in the, is the great city. Another clue. The great city. What's the great city? Which rules over the kings of the earth. It's Vatican City. It's an entity politically or religiously in and of itself. It just happens to be in the city of Rome. For this system was morphed over. Got to keep a priesthood. We got to keep a pope. We got to keep a high priest. We got to keep all this stuff. So this is how we're going to do it. And this finally worked its way through so you have this top-down system that does not resemble anything in the New Testament for a local church and independent. Politically tied. See, that's the harlot aspect. That's the immoral aspect. A man goes out and finds a prostitute. He gives her money for sex. That's understood. In, the, in this regard, in, re, in this regard, the woman promises certain things to the kings of the earth and they do certain things for her. That's the way that works. All right. Alexander the Great. Note that in conclusion of this session, he's the most famous king of the ancient world, bar none. And there were some famous, uh, the same famous uh, military leaders of antiquity, no question about it. He's the most written about, studied. His military feats were unmatched. He became a prototype to subsequent leaders. Race-wise, he is a European. White-skinned European. His rise and fall is the subject of Old Testament prophecy, which we noted in Daniel 8. I needed to bring something back to your attention because it, I stumbled over it a little bit, which we'll pick up in our second session, but just turn to Daniel 8 and you'll have your place in the Bible. It's not that hard to find, okay? Find the book of Daniel and go to chapter 8. Pretend like you care. Pretend like this, maybe this is the word of God and it really matters, after all. That this is where the action is, gang. Not in all the distractions of the cosmos. Oh, I get distracted by it too. I'm not trying to set up here and be better than you, but I am in one sense. I spend, well, that's my gift and my job, but I should. I spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. And I spent many years working on it. So you'd think you'd go to that if you were interested. But I can't make you positive. I don't have some drink back there you can take and, oh, I'm positive. It's got to come from within you. Period. And that, if it sticks there, what's, what's the reward for all this? You can't even imagine the things God has prepared for those who love him. And those who love him are the ones who learn and do his will. It's that simple. It's not complicated. But we all have to start somewhere. You don't start with math and take advanced, advanced uh, trigonometry. <laughs> 
You start, if you're gonna be a carpenter, you don't start with some elaborate, you start real basic and you work your way up until you get smarter and smarter and better and better and better until you become an expert. And if you do that with Bible doctrine, wait till you see what we're gonna reap forever. I can't even describe it, but I live by faith that the Bible's right and, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and I intend to stick by it. All right, let's take our break. Should a donut and a cup of coffee or something.